All right, welcome to the Von Cash Show. Hope everyone's doing well. Today I got Laura with me. How are you today? I'm good, Vaughn. How are you? I'm doing well. Friday. Yeah, I'm super excited for watch. the weekend. Oh, really? Okay, that's awesome. Any plans for the weekend? Uh, just church stuff. Going to do some extra work as well. What about you? Let's see. I work tomorrow, but I'm off Sunday, so I'll be chilling and relaxing. Love that. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. For context, this is our second attempt at the podcast. The first time around, uh, there were some technical difficulties, which happens with podcasting sometimes, and uh, we're doing it over. So thank you again for taking your time out to do this. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me. And also for context, I have just come in because I had to go pick up my friend's little sister because she took too much Sudafed with her other medication. She was super drowsy. So Vaughn gave me grace as well for being late for today. You know, that's awesome. You would do that. And that's very responsible for her to acknowledge mm. that, hey, I can't drive that well right now. I'm on Sudafed. So good for you. Good for her. Uh, yeah, she's awesome. She's awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So today we'll be talking about content marketing, going viral finding faith and coping with bad days. Okay, you're a content marketing expert. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what is marketing and what attracted you to it? Yeah, so when you asked me this question last week, the thing that immediately popped in my head was that sales is more of a masculine energy and marketing is more of a feminine energy. So with sales, you're always kind of going and you're chasing, but marketing is something where you show the world who you are by being really good and communicating that, and then you get inbound sales. So with marketing, we want to expose people to what's good about us long-term over time. And what initially interested me about marketing is that I do have quite a bit of feminine energy myself. I do this sales stuff because I have to. Like, You can't be an entrepreneur and survive without having that sales side, but I do truly enjoy attracting more than I enjoy being pushy. It just is more within my nature and more within my natural skill set to enjoy marketing. Uh, Okay. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, Actually makes total sense uh, with what you're describing it as. Um, And content marketing, that's something I'm fairly new to. Mm. What exactly is content marketing? Yeah. So content marketing isn't like branding and all that sort of stuff. It's taking your brand and what you do and putting it out there on social media. So pretty much I just do social media marketing, but it's kind of a broader spectrum because I'll also help people do YouTube videos or podcasts or anything like that that lets them show who they are. Okay. That's good. That's a that's a good answer. I guess it makes sense where, you know, you have something and people may want to know more about who you are and what you do. Mm-hmm. Like a marketing thing. You know, get behind the scenes kind of thing. Uh, it makes you maybe feel more relatable, right? Cause- exactly. Because if you think about it, say you have a water bottle company, right? Why would someone buy a water bottle? Because I've got a water bottle right here as well. So why would someone buy a water bottle when really what you could do is just fill it up from your sink? They're not just buying the water bottle. They're buying what the water bottle means. So say, for example, it says like filtered on it. You're buying the feeling of safety, of security, of health. You know what I mean? People don't just buy the product. They buy the emotions behind them. And that's what marketing's here for. Marketing's here to display that over time. So that way it doesn't just seem like a one-off, by the way. Like, cause you know how in the real world, whenever anything seems so good to be true, too good to be true, or like someone's coming up to you, And they're being super nice. A lot of times it can feel salesy. But if they're like that consistently over time, you go, oh, that person's actually a good person. They weren't just trying to sell me something. So that's kind of what marketing is. It's taking that good part of you and showing that, hey, this actually is a good part of me because I do it consistently. Right. Speaking of water bottles, here's mine. (laughs) Hydro, Like a Target off-brand of hydro flasks and stuff. Wow, you don't have a Stanley. The the uh, American girls are going to kill you. I know. <laughs> Those are hard to find. But um, I remember back then there was, I don't it's kind of older, but like I remember when water bottles would first gave you the option of like letting the water stay cool. That was, mm. 
I was so foreign. I'm like, wow, that's we're like moving <laughs> to the future. Yeah. I want to be warm, but now it's like it's still cold after like a couple hours. What was it? It was the swells, I think, were first. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Like, that just blew me away. I'm like, wow, we're we're like, we're getting there. Um, <laughs> speaking of podcasts, I met you through Threads, which is mm-hmm. the trans version of Twitter for those who don't know. Uh, I really like that community. Me and too. I, I don't know. I think it was through podcast threads that I found your um, your stuff at a Jew. Uh, so naturally, you have a podcast uh, called Answers. Can you mm. talk to us about it, the backstory and how it came to be? Yeah, of course. So Answers actually started because, I mean, I wanted to meet different people. I think what podcasts are really good at that people underestimate is not just being podcasts, but being tools to meet new people. So my podcast is primarily me just really wanting to talk to people I'm interested in talking to. I think it's really important to also provide quality information. I think that if a conversation wasn't good, I would just scrap it. But overall, podcasts are really strong networking and attraction tools. And that's what I help people do as well. Use it to talk to people who could bring them to the next level in their business. And it doesn't always happen, obviously. But A lot of times when people spend a good amount of time with you, they'll go, wow, that person actually has something cool to say, especially if you're listening to them and really you do a good job as a podcaster. It shows a lot of diligence. But before getting into the Answers podcast, how I got started in podcasting in general was sometime around last year, I messaged someone named Shiraz Bolsher, who's one of the founders of People Like Us, which is a charity in London who, I mean, I spoke at one of their events. And I ended up hosting their podcast and we had a sponsor and everything. And that's how I got started in podcasting in general. I learned a lot from their team behind the scenes about the production value and how things work. And then from there, I kind of just carried it on because podcasts are blowing up at the moment. They're the new blogs. So people want to know how to do it and they don't want to look like idiots. And that's what I'm here for. Okay. No, that's awesome. You know, uh, I remember when I first started my podcast, it was like, 2017 mm-hmm. i was using google voice because i didn't have all this technology and everything oh that's awesome yeah it was kind of grainy audio but like you said it was just the conversation it's what really drew me to podcasting i'm still doing it um yeah it's a great way to ma- meet people and ma- build relationships um also good quality information out there but yeah it's just for me it's the talking aspect and just Having fun conversations. I, I don't know. I don't I don't really talk like this. I mean I do outside of podcasting, but I'm mm. kind of keep to myself for the most part. So this is like a fun social exercise because I like to just stay in these days. Yeah, that's so cool. And I think you're really well suited for podcasts as well. You've got a very calming voice and your whole communications process is really good as well. So for people listening, when you set up a podcast, it's really important for with the guests, making them feel as comfortable as possible. And a lot of that is the communication that goes on behind the scenes. And that's when a lot of people can get it wrong and make people feel very anxious before coming on and filming an episode. And Vaughn, I feel like you really did it well. You sent me the questions ahead of time. You sent me the links on the day and stuff like that. So definitely, you're you're a seasoned pro and it shows. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't like putting guests on the spot so much. I mean, some people do. I like to have the questions ahead of time just because, I don't know, I just, I don't want to trip up any guests. It's not my purpose. It's just have them talk about things they're comfortable talking about. And sometimes I have guests where they, you know, I send questions and like, oh, yo, you know, uh, I've not comfortable with this question or after the recording oh hey um can we take that out I'm like, okay that's fine that's cool no worries you know? same but yeah, yeah. Definitely. it's really good yeah the communication part's cool so thank you um okay so content content marketing expert you say you uh you know you do a lot of social media stuff lately for me i feel like I don't know. I'm getting burnt out with social media. I feel like mm. more and more the algorithm demands you to create more content and post. And it's just really difficult. You know, I, like everybody else, I have a job and I have my own life outside of social media. I remember back then, man, a few years ago, it was like more visibility and you have to, you don't have to do as much, you know, 
But now I feel like you got to do so much and it's just overwhelming. So my question is, you know, do you have any suggestions to like minimize or prevent burnout as a content creator on social? Yes, absolutely. Either hire someone to do it for you or heavily use AI or a combination of use someone who uses AI to do it for you. Chat GPT, you know, it's a, it's an amazing tool. And I know people talk about it and we all know what it is. But seriously, if you know how to use Chat GPT and you know the right prompts to put in, it'll make your life 100% easier. You'll have a plan. You know what to follow. It's really just you got to do it and it's done. But Chat GPT, AI, Canva is another great one. If you have preset templates, what else? There, Marketing Harry is a really good person to follow to know the different AI tools to use as well. But really at the core of it, you, you could have a million AI tools, but it's just going to be oversubscribing you and spending too much of your money. But the ones that I definitely recommend are Canva, ChatGPT, and CapCut. Because CapCut has a really good AI generator tool for all of those fancy captions that you see on social media as well. It makes life 1,000 times easier. Yeah, I use CapCut a lot. Mm. The, it's a cool tool. Um, before that, I was using like, um, what was it? iMovie. And I know there's other programs mm. out there like um, Final Cut Pro. Oh, yeah. Premiere, but they're so expensive. And what I like about CapCut, it's very budget friendly because it's free. Exactly. And yeah, there's like a premium version, but I feel like I'm doing a lot with just a free one. I don't have to buy the premium. And AI. Okay. What? Okay. I don't know exactly what chat GPT is. I know it's AI, but mm -hmm. I just know like, what does it exactly do? Yeah, of course. So you know how Google brings up search results kind of thing. It's a bit like Google. You can put in a prompt. So say if you were, you wanted someone to write a letter to a, like, like as a legal team to an employee who is say doing something inappropriate in the office. The reason why I thought of this example is because the first time chat GBT was explained to me, I was actually at this cafe in London on Portobello road. I met this guy named, I think his name is Punya, Puya. And he was sitting next to me at this store called Natora. And we were both having like our coffees and our teas. We got to chatting. He shows me ChatGPT. And I'm like, what's ChatGPT? Because he's this really cool guy. He has this whole like web development industry sort of thing. And he brings up ChatGPT and he's like, watch this. So he types in, he's like, act as the legal team to write a letter <laughs> to um, an employee who's watching inappropriate stuff online and tell him to stop. And this letter was just generated, but you can literally use it for anything. So say, for example, I had Joseph S. Kahn, who's literally an SEO genius on my podcast. And if you're really specific with the prompts, you can get some really good stuff out of it. You can get advice like you were getting advice from Bill Gates. So what he does is he's, he goes, put Neil Patel, uh, Bill Gates, and maybe like Alex Hermazi in a room and have them discuss xyz problem that you have and it'll generate what they would say histor based on like their historical answers and their historical marketing decisions it's a really really smart program i gotta check it out now i use definitely AI, this program riverside we're recording on um it creates it creates a transcription for the podcast and um you can create the show notes and the takeaways and and the summary which is great because for like 200 episodes laura i was typing and it was like so repetitive hey right. welcome how's it it's Vaughn. you know here i am as my guest we talk about this this and this and it just it was honestly it was a chore i mean i can do it it's just it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. what's nice is this one creates a timestamps automatically so i have to do it and yeah it's just ai is really cool I, admittedly i was afraid of it i still kind of am so you, mm -hmm. guys, you know Terminator, I grew up on that. And it's like, hey, I was going to take over. But for now, it seems cool. There's definitely some negative things with it. Uh, but it, for my purposes, it's pretty useful. It cuts mm -hmm. down a lot of time. Like you said, it's utilizing it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. And then the one other content tip I give to prevent burnout, just in terms of creativity and coming up with concepts easier, is live your life. Do cool things and you'll have cool things to write about. Okay. Yeah, you know what? That's a very good um, thing to, to say because 
I don't know. I feel like you're being genuine in that way. And if you mm-hmm. want to document a little bit of it, but I don't know. I feel like sometimes you have to do all these certain things and you don't necessarily have to, you know? Um, but yeah, it's just, I feel like posting content a lot is, it's tough work if you're doing other things outside of just doing that. Um, in your opinion, like, do certain times of the day matter when you post? Uh, not so much. I think that the algorithms reward consistency. So if you're consistent in the time you're posting, and I know on Instagram as well, what you do is you look in the analytics and you see when your followers are most active. What you want to do is you want to post a half an hour before that time. But with that being said, nothing beats quality content. So get down your content first before you start worrying about timing. It's like if you have a a bad diet and you're worrying about whether you should take a green supplement, like eat your vegetables first. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Um, I remember, yeah, I, I remember doing that too. It's like, Oh, what protein supplement should I take or what? Vitamin <laughs> I, take? I was not very healthy. Mm-hmm. I don't think it mattered. Like I remember when I was using drugs heavily, I would take like supplements to kind of help like my dopamine levels and all mm-hmm. this stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna take a bunch of Molly and but but I take this and it'll all feel better. But then looking back, it's like, no. <laughs> and like, I'm like, it's such that's not the problem. <laughs> the problem <laughs> using, but I, I couldn't mm-hmm. you know I was then and I really couldn't see it and that's okay. But uh, I was yeah, same same concept. Like I guess you have to have like good co- content first before you have to worry about all the numbers and everything. And mm-hmm. yeah. And speaking of numbers and content, you said you had a video on TikTok that went viral. Mm. I think, man, every well, the thing is now to go viral. I feel like that's the goal of social media. Some people purposely do controversial things or say like really hot takes, even if they don't agree with it. And like, I don't know. It's like a race to go go viral. And it has some good good things in there, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the views and the likes and engagements, and that can propel your brand or whatever you're doing. But no one really talks so much about the pitfalls. From your experience, or in general, from what you, you know, what your clients experience, what are some of the pitfalls of uh, going viral? Yeah, I think uh, what you said is really wise. First of all, but definitely one of the biggest pitfalls of going viral is that virality does not equal sales and people think that it does. It it just doesn't. Now, if you go viral over and over and over again and you build up your brand on that and your brand is helping people go viral, sure, yeah, you absolutely need that. My content strategy though, I've I've gone viral several times on TikTok um, with I think two times where it was like over 5 million views. Uh, But it's not my strategy at all anymore. And if you look at my social media nowadays, it's very apparent. And that's because, like you said, there are a lot of big downsides that go from coming viral that come from going viral. And some of those are, for example, w- the hate you get, first of all. So the first video I had that went viral was on this study done on pretty privilege. And I had like eight year old boys making videos about how ugly I was because it was a punchline. And it's not even like I have those particular confidence issues, but I was like, why am I subjecting myself? Like, why am I making a video that an eight-year-old sees and like thinks that they want to make a video about how ugly I am? I don't think that's the type of content that I want to be making. And then the second video I had that I went viral on is was something around one of Dan Ariely's studies on pred- Predictably Irrational, one of his books. And I literally just pretty much read the numbers out of the book and I got so much hate from it. I literally had people like telling me every day to go kill myself, like all that kind of stuff. It was wild. And I was like, this is over a TikTok. They're like, um, you positioned yourself as an expert and blah, 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 because they were saying something like Dan Ariely was was accused of data fraud, which he messed up like some value. I looked it up on later and it was like messed up some value and not on the study that I reported on. But he's he's such a good guy. I actually work with Dan now. He's, I mean, kind of as a result of that TikTok. So there are upsides to it, right? But Dan is such a good guy. And that was just crazy what what came as a result of that TikTok. And I actually shut my TikTok down for, from that for months and months. Virality is, it's not for the faint of heart, for sure. And you definitely need to know what you're getting into 
when you go viral and be very, very careful about your emotions during it. And you need to be prepared. Yeah, honestly, I don't think I'm ready for, it. you know, it's just, it's a lot. You know, I, I feel like, well, as a podcast host and musician, if I can get a solid amount of fans, buy stuff for me, they like my music and content. I'm cool with it. You know, I think mm-hmm. when I was younger, I think the thing was, oh, I want to like famous and all this stuff. And this was before social media, like, you know, early 2000s, the music and everything. And now I see it, man. It's just really tough. I, I have empathy for the younger generation, especially right. they're on social media and they go viral because, you know, in a previous podcast, I talked to uh, someone who's a therapist and they said that our brains aren't fully developed until we're like in our mid twenties, mm-hmm. and you're b- being bombar- bombarded with just a bunch of information, good and bad. You know, a lot of positive and negative comments at a young age. I don't know how how will I deal with that. It's tough. I mean, when I was younger, I was not very rational. I was just mm-hmm. you know short tempered, everything. So it's just tough. I just have a lot of empathy, you know. And there have been things where like kids. Mm-hmm. You know, kill themselves or just self harm because of it, and it's just it's really sad. It's so sad, and yeah, you're right on the ball with it being kind of almost dangerous. It's actually very dangerous for kids, right? Like, let's get real. Social media in the hands of anyone, like honestly, seventeen year olds or younger, like it's going to affect their confidence. It's going to make them compare themselves because we know that people who are younger, they tend to be more narcissistic. They tend to chase dopamine more. It's just, it's just a byproduct of being young and exposing them to that sort of control over how many eyes are on them. That's so dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Back then for me, my space was like our social media and it was like <laughs> super invasive. Sorry. You just showed your age. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you can't tell, but yeah, I'm, I'm 36. <laughs> But yeah, MySpace, man, good old MySpace. I remember, mm-hmm. I feel like it was like, oh, geez, like back in my day. Well, back in my day, I remember we'd have to wait to go home and check our computer for MySpace. It wasn't on the phones yet. I remember we had a computer class and we were on like MySpace. And one of the parents complained, like, how come I see my son online on MySpace in computer class? So they they banned MySpace. They we found a way around it but it wasn't as bad but then Mm -hmm. you know Facebook and everything I remember maybe my generation was the last generation where we grew up without social media until we were so 18 19 you know like middle you know like we were somewhat developed but I don't know I don't know how it is for kids like really young having Instagram and all that stuff and social media we have a we had somewhat of an identity of who we were before social media Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, yeah, I I really admire the parents who are able to hold out and not give their kids phones and not let them on that stuff until a certain age. I definitely think that that's really the healthy way to go. Back in my day, I had a cell phone, but it's only used for emergencies. Really? My backpack. It was a, it was that phone they used in the Matrix, Matrix One, and mm. it was my backpack. Like, okay, here's your cell phone, but only use it for emergencies and I only use it to like call my parents to like hey can you pick me up or I'm here can you pick me up or something like that oh okay but that was it I mean okay were you using MySpace growing up or was that not no so I'm 25 so when I was growing up I think the first social media I had might have been Instagram or Facebook one of those and I got it, I think, right when I turned 13 as well. I had a phone, though, from the time that I was eight because my parents were divorced. And I mean, it didn't really matter because no one else had a phone. So I couldn't really use it anyway until I was a bit older. I would just text my cousin on it. But definitely, as soon as I turned 13, it was like I was out there. I was in the world. I was posting. You know, I was comparing myself. Like, I remember being an eighth grade girl or in, like even a, up to a sophomore in high school, like 16 posting a picture and like worrying about how many likes it would get you know it's it's really like it was so stressful and i know that kids are still facing that stress today yeah um i think that's kind of cool you're able to hide likes on instagram now just for that i mean Mm. i'm still like that sometimes oh man like you know i know instagram kind of like watered down their views now i think you have to like either pay for that blue check or like 
pay for some ads or whatever. But back then, I remember my my podcast would get a bunch of views on Instagram and it would get more views as a result, people listening. Now it's like, dude, it doesn't get a fraction of the views. And I'm like, man, this is a bummer. I know mm. TikTok has more views. You can get more views on TikTok, but still I was like, what's going on? And like I, for a minute, I was like questioning, like, is this, am I not like doing good? But then I had some friends about it and just realized that this is the algorithm. It's not me. It's not my content. It's just, it's how it is, you know? And um, yeah, again, I remember uh, like, grow, you know, when I was a lot younger, like definitely MySpace, just like social media definitely had a lot to, it really impacted my social life, personal life and everything. And just, you know, I was like in college and it was still tripping over like likes and like comments. Oh, what did this person say? What did that person say? I was, I was, I was a grown adult, you know, like, so I can't imagine like how how kids uh, deal with that stuff. Yeah, for real. That's a really good point. Okay. So, and in our previous conversation, you said like you recently found faith in God. Right. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Did you grow? Did you grow up religious or not so much? No, not at all. So around the time where I was supposed to be baptized, uh, I think the whole thing with the Catholic priests just happened in Boston. So for context, I grew up in New Hampshire. So New Hampshire is like an hour away from Boston. My dad was already really not that religious, but at that point, he just wanted absolutely nothing to do with the Catholic Church because of that. Understandably enough. So I grew up not religious whatsoever. And then I remember when I was 18, I went to Israel to go visit my friend who was there on your course because she's Jewish. And when I went to Israel, I think that's the first time where I felt like the spirit, if you know what I mean. Like I, I felt very at peace and I went home really inspired and I started looking into Christianity. Somewhere along the way with that, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, okay, I don't want to admit this, but I will admit it because I just laughed and I said that now, like everyone listening is going to be like, oh my gosh, she has to tell us now. But basically there was this lady at the church who said to me, she goes, Laura, you might never find anyone um, like rom- like like a boyfriend or a husband and you might have to be okay with that. And at the time I was like, no, absolutely not. Uh, that's not happening to me. <laughs> And so I literally, I stopped going because I hated that. She said that to me so much. And I didn't really think about faith again for years until I went and I spoke at an event for the, the People Like Us event um, that I mentioned. And at the time I spoke there because I was a director of a charity called Voice of Sia. So Voice of Sia was featured on ITV three times for our work in like police data hate crime reporting. I, I don't know. I can't talk right now. It's because it's 3 p.m. on a Friday. But basically, we were advocating against East and Southeast Asian violence that happened as a result of the pandemic. And so I was speaking there. And alongside me was this guy named Saba Amadi. And he's the young imam on Instagram. He's really cool. He's he's about to blow up. He's an awesome guy. But he is basically the Muslim version of a priest kind of thing. That's what an imam is. So I kind of developed a friendship with him, right? Because the whole group, like everyone who spoke that night, there are 10 speakers and they speak for three minutes each. We all became quite good friends. And through him, he kind of challenged some of my beliefs, I guess. Like, Vaughn, you know how in America there is still a lot of like anti-Muslim ideals. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, he, one of the things that he said on Instagram one day was like most Americans think that Muslims are violent and I was like wait yeah actually I do think that I try not to think that I try not to act on that either but I was honest with myself I said yeah you know what I do think that especially my aunt growing up she was hit by her ex-husband and that kind of definitely shaped the way that I thought about things but I realized you know religions are separate from the people who practice them, right? People are never going to be perfect. So I took the time to learn about Islam. And through that, I realized how much I was missing God in my life. But Islam ended up not being for me. I actually recorded that whole journey on TikTok. But I ended up going to church. Like I literally did the Costco sampler of churches because something called me to Christianity. And so I ended up becoming Christian. I'm part of the Mormon faith. Actually, that's where I ended up, which is interesting because it's actually quite similar to Islam. 
But that's the story of how I found Jesus over the past year. The gospel literally changed my life, though. I I was attracted to both Islam and Mormonism because I think I told you as well. I stopped drinking coffee. I stopped drinking any alcohol. I stopped vaping. And um, both of those religions pretty strongly advocate against those things. So culturally, it's easier to find people who don't do those things in those communities. Um, and also the message was just really strong for me and it's helped me stay on the path of sobriety a lot as well, because turning to God is definitely a healthier coping mechanism than turning to alcohol or vaping. So that's kind of how I found faith in the past year. <laughs> you told me your age by the, because you kept saying vaping and not cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Yours was my space. Your tell was my face. Mine is that I vape. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. That's really amazing. And yeah, hundred percent. I feel like, um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are Muslim and they're great. And I, it's just, I think a certain population of Muslim faith that are like extremists, they kind of put a bad name for everybody else that's Muslim, mm-hmm. but great people. Um, I grew up Catholic. Um, uh, mm-hmm. I have a, had a priest in my family. I think it's like my older relative when I was younger and, uh, you know, so Catholicism was a thing for me. I, uh, I'm Filipino. So like, mm-hmm definitely you're just born uh, you're born catholic i went to catholic school for middle school it was there you know it was it was cool like i never really i never really got it i get it i i i admire i'm glad that it can help people's lives you know i'm happy that it can help you become a better person i'm all for it um for me i what wasn't my thing but I mm-hmm. it. um for me, though, like faith was in a different way. I would, I, I would go to twelve step program, Narcotics Anonymous, and the thing is, you know, one of the principle, one of the steps is you have to surrender to a higher power, a higher power of your understanding. Mm-hmm. Not mean religious, but to me, uh, I found that like to me, that's what it was, and I think the first time it made sense, made sense was. I remember I was two weeks clean, no drugs, and I was having a really tough time. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, fuck it. Bro. I'm, I'm getting hot. I don't care. So I, I called, you know, I contacted the person that I would go to, and they didn't. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm not around right now, or I'm, I'm at work. And I'm like, you know, work? I thought this is the only job, selling drugs or whatever. And that was like, huh, maybe I was just like, okay, this is an interesting sign. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe it's something because there was something there, and I had this feeling. I'm like, "Don't push it. Like, do not push it. Like, mm-hmm. you're doing good. You're two weeks clean. Don't push it, man. Don't, don't." Mm. So I was like, I got kind of scared. I'm like, "Fuck it. I'm, I'm not going to contact this person." You know. So that was like, that was, there was something there. There was some sort of intervention. I really don't know how to describe it other than that. But it's just like maybe it's my conscience. You know, so that's how I found it. And it's to me, it's just, I just know I'm not in control. I think in the past when I was using, I wanted to be in control. When situations didn't go well, didn't go my way. Obviously, I don't have the power to literally like change circumstances, but I can get high. You know, I can can like drown out or my, that feeling or get high and just forget, numb the pain. Mm Mm-hmm. So I realized that that was my way of control. And now it's like, I'm not in control. And I feel like uh, I got to tell myself that, that I only have so much little control and the rest of it, it's up to the universe, God or higher power. It is what it is. So to me, that brought me somewhat of a relief. I'm still an anxious person. Mm -hmm. But when things get tough, it's like, well, I'm not gonna get high. Can't do it. Having a bad. I love day. that. But it is what it is. Like it's gonna get better. I think I feel that uh, it's gonna get better, and I have faith that it will get better. You know. So I think that's my version of higher power, my understanding, and shit, man. Things got better little by little, not not instantaneously. Mm-hmm. I mean, it took like little by little. I started noticing things in myself. But it took like a year to really like feel like, oh, wow, this is, I'm on the right path. Right. And uh, it's what worked for me. 
I love that. And, you know, getting high and stuff like that and seeking different highs in life, you know, I think it's something that a lot of us are really drawn to because of that element of control that you said. We're so afraid of the future and the bad things that could happen that we forget, like, there are things that are so good in this world that you don't even, you don't even know to ask for them, right? Like, the things that God has planned for you or whatever higher power you believe in, like, there is so much good waiting if you just start acting on it and you start acting through either faith in God and faith in yourself and your purpose. Like, you have no idea. You have no idea what kind of stuff is waiting for you. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I agree with that. It's just also, too, it's like, I felt like, oh, I'm not going to be in control. Like, who's going to control my life? But now it's and mm-hmm. also what I, a part of it, too. It's like, I got to surrender my will to my higher power. At first, I'm like, the fuck? Like, that's fucking weird. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to say the serenity prayer? Yeah. 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 So I, I went to Overeaters Anonymous because I had an eating disorder. And, like, I remember the serenity prayer as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, what does that mean? And I think now it's just like, yo, I'm going to do what, I, what I'm going to do. And I, I'm, I'm so fixed. I'm so like fixated on the outcome. This is going to happen. That's going to happen at this time and that time. Mm. You know, this is my path. You know, I got it planned and it's like, I can only plan. And I think I, when, when things don't go my way, it's like, why is it going my way? But then it's like, why would it go my way? You know, mm-hmm. I think I'm just expecting so much. Again, it's a form of control. When I let go, it's like, it is what it is. What's happened is going to happen. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, hopefully it'll be okay. You know, I think that's it. From what I've seen from my progress so far, it's going to be okay. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not next week. But eventually it'll be okay. And once I try to like relinquish that control, I'm not in control. I feel a little better. Mm-hmm. Truly, love that. And okay, so again, that's awesome. I'm glad that you found your faith. And that's really cool that you found it through looking at different religions, Muslim. I did the Costco sampler for sure. Costco sampler. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's a cool way. Of putting it. <laughs> okay, yeah, I love Costco. Love the samples. <laughs> Me too. I like the pizza and the hot dogs. Is there was there a Costco? Was there like a something similar to Costco in the UK? They have Costco in the UK. Oh, they do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no idea. Oh, wow. Okay. Did they serve pizza and hot dog too? Uh, I don't actually know if I ever went when I was over there. I didn't have a car. Okay, no worries. I don't have a car either. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So we talked a little bit about this, but how do you how do you deal with bad days? Because obviously. Hey, we can plan or we can have good vibes, but sometimes just mm. days are bad. How do you how do you deal? Definitely turning to other people. It's my number one. Call a friend, talk to my friends. Uh, I have also. I'm still like I mentioned. I had an eating disorder. I was quite like underweight for like two years. So I'm still working with people through that. So I've got professionals, luckily, that I can reach out to as well, and they'll respond to me. Um. But yeah, I think other people and then praying as well. Those are two really good ways. Distracting yourself in, is sometimes good, but then sometimes you also need to let yourself feel it. It's like finding that balance between it. Like you don't want to wallow in sadness all day. You want to be doing stuff, but then you also do need to let yourself cry. Yeah, those are great healthy coping mechanism. I like tar- I like turning to other people. Mm. You know, um, I'm still working on just that meditation and prayer aspect yeah. of things. Uh, I think on bad days where like I know I've been struggling, I'm like, all right, higher power, God, whatever it may mm-hmm. be, give me the strength to get through today. Right. Like give me the wisdom. Let me let me like have the courage to act on it. Because sometimes I gotta do things I really don't want to do. Right. Like it you know, and I feel like it, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. And it's like, yo, let me, you know, let me be up front with a situation, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? Mm. Um, and yeah, that, that helps out talking to people, talking to friends. That's what I do now. I remember mm. back then my friends are like, okay, they never told me don't do drugs. They're like, from what I get, 
you're getting high because you you can't handle the whatever you're going through. Talk mm-hmm. it out. Let's talk it out. And they always gave me that uh, that option. I didn't always. I rarely ever took it. I talked to them afterwards when I was high, but mm-hmm. it now it's like okay, I, I see the benefit of this, like therapy. So yeah, uh, I, I really that's that's what I do. Distraction is great. I mean, yeah, on a really bad day, you know, I'm just watching my shows, eating pizza maybe, but hmm. also sleep. Sleep is like so- oh, sleep is so important. Yeah, I think aside from having the bad days, because the answers I gave are kind of short term. I would say you can manage your bad days a lot better if you keep up healthy habits on the long term. So making sure that you get enough sleep. I exercise six days a week. I really do. And that builds so much discipline and trust in myself because even on the days where I really don't want to, I do it. So if there's a day that I'm sad, I'm still so much on autopilot that I go and do it. And I think Andrew Huberman, do you know who Andrew Huberman is? You know what? I would follow. I listened to his podcast back in the day. Yeah. 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 So in one of his podcasts, he talks about kind of the positive feelings you get from doing something that you don't want to do. And if you've built up that muscle, of really being able to do things that you don't want to do and you don't want to do them, you you do get this immense feeling of accomplishment and on a bad day that can make a lot of difference. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's like, yeah, does that muscle, I mean, a lot of times for me, I get so hesitant. I'm like, not the podcasting so much, but the post work, like, oh man, I got to like, upload edit all this stuff i read i'm like procrastinating not to do it but once i do it it's like oh i feel a lot better Mm -hmm. there's that that thing um i remember very clearly there was a podcast episode on addiction he uh had someone had an author talking about dopamine and everything and i remember they're saying oh you know like you know, going to 12 step programs is really good and everything. And it really helps in my head. I'm like, nah, man, I'm not going to go that route. It's not going to work for me. That's, I don't know. I was so against it, but then now I'm in it. And I'm like, wow, you're right. Mm. That kind of makes sense. That's awesome. That's cool to look back on stuff like that and reflect. Yeah, it really is. Well, I think that is about it. Uh, so where can we find you on social media slash online? Oh yeah, of course. So my Instagram is at Laura My Marketing. So that's L A U R A M A I M A R. You know how to spell marketing. Basically, Laura My Marketing. And then you can also find me on LinkedIn at Laura My. And then I have a website too. But I'll send that stuff to you. Maybe you can put it in like a description or something. You got it. Well, thank you again for this awesome convo. Personally, I think this convo was better. Yeah, I was gonna say th- thanks, Juan, for having me. This is like. 10 times better than the first one. I don't even know how. Yeah. yeah it's just a lot better. Thank you for sharing everything uh, you did. Uh, and it's just really cool. Really good conversation. Again, I'm glad you found your faith and just makes you a better person. I think, again, makes you a better person. You're not harming anybody. Anybody. That's great. So congrats on not drinking and not smoking. Curious, how long has it been for you? Um, well, I've never actually been too much of a drinker. I would say I dated an Italian guy and that's when I got the worst of the vaping and the drinking. But my biggest, my biggest addiction has definitely been like struggling with food. Um, but I, I've been in recovery for like the past year. Good. Yeah. You know, I'm noticing for me too, like I'm noticing a pattern when I've, when I'm anxious, mm-hmm. uncomfortable feeling, I go for food. That's like my, right. It's like the hidden vice, like, oh, I can, it's not drugs. I can it's the hardest one because you can't just abstain from it. Everything else I just don't do because I don't want to transfer my addiction, right? But food, I just, I still have to eat. Yeah. It's just, for me, I'm, I'm noticing it now. I think now that I have like 17 months of clean time with drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. It's like, wow. All right. Do I really need to finish that whole, whole box of cereal and like, and so I don't really need to do it. Mm-hmm. A lot of times I'm like, I'm not even that hungry. Why am I doing this? Like I find myself buying like a, a big tub of ice cream. And it's like, oh, why am I doing this? Like, mm. But I, I keep eating. I keep eating. So I'm thinking that, all right, I'm probably bored and probably it tastes really good. There's something in there. So yeah, it's something being mindful of too. 
Yeah, that's awesome. It's awesome that you're aware of it as well. For me, I pretty much abstain from like anything that's not a whole food just because, again, like the addiction brain sort of thing. And the way that I've kind of figured out whether I'm hungry or not is just like what I eat a vegetable right now. And the crazy thing is we as humans, like we get a lot hungrier than we were kind of shown on diet culture kind of stuff, right? Um, it's about finding that balance and kind of finding that trust in your body. But yeah, you're so awesome. And I know that you'll find the balance. Thank you. Wait, I like what you said. If you're hungry, would I eat a vegetable? So yeah, does that mean like if you're not hungry, you won't eat a vegetable? Yeah, if you're not hungry, you're not going to eat a vegetable. Like, who are you kidding? <laughs> like, if the only thing you want is Ben and Jerry's, like, you're not actually hungry. You have a craving. You want to hide. Oh, yeah. I'm alone right now. Yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 hold up, hold up. Wait, that's that's a craving. So craving yeah. is not being hungry. So when you're hungry, it'll be satisfied by pretty much any food. If it's a craving, you'll want one thing specifically, or like one type of food very specifically. Oh, okay. Yeah, I learned something new today. There you go. How's my year of therapy coming in? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, sometimes I have like, I had like a sweet potato in my fridge for like the longest time I never ate it. Mm -hmm. Like chips and like ice cream and pizza all the time. And it's like potato right there. Yeah. People laugh at me because I'll literally eat raw carrots. I'm like, well, I was hungry enough for it. Like clearly, like my body needed it. (laughs) I need to eat more vegetables. Again, show my age. I'm not in my 20s anymore. Even though I look 20s. I'm not in my 20s. I'm in my mid 30s, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. And like now, I'm like, I have to be mindful. I gotta like look at this nutrition label thing. Look at the sugar mm-hmm. and the, the salt. So yeah, it's something I gotta work on. But again, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. This has been awesome, Vaughn.